for Sheree. Okay. All right. Um, uh, also, if you're online, feel free to post your questions in the chat throughout the talk, and then we can read them out at the end or raise your hand and we'll call on you. All right, so today we're gonna to be hearing uh, from John Tomsick. Um, John got his bachelor in physics at UC San Diego, followed by a PhD in physics uh, from Columbia University. He then went on to do a postdoc and researcher position at UC San Diego. Um, and then this was followed by a researcher position at UC Berkeley uh, Space Science Laboratory or SSL. Um, some of the projects he's involved in include the Chandra observations of X-ray jets from galactic black holes, uh, reflection modeling to study inner regions of accretion disk, um, and then finally studies of hard X-ray source populations. He's also involved in NewSTAR. Uh, he's the chair of X-ray binaries working group and the COSY uh, balloon. He's the project scientist on the COSY balloon project. <laughs> Um, his current position is the SSL Associate Director of Astrophysics and uh, Exoplanets, and he's also the PI of the COSY Small uh, Explorer. Um, so today he'll be talking to us about the Compton Spectrometer and Imaging Project for MEV Astronomy. So with that, uh, go ahead and take it away, John. All right. Uh, thank you, Amy, and uh, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, so COSY um, is a wide field of view, Compton telescope. Um, it's designed to work in the 0.2 to 5 MeV uh, band pass. Um, it's a small explorer. So um, this is like New Star uh, and XP are both uh, other examples of, of small explorers. And so uh, COSY is in that class. Um, we were selected for a phase A concept study in March, 2020. Um, and we carried that out pretty much during the you know, worst parts of the pandemic uh, and completed the concept study report in March 2021. Um, uh, you know, then uh, in October 2021, we, we were selected to move to phase B, um, which is where we are now. Um, all right, so let me see if I can advance these. It's working before. Okay, good. All right, um, so just to overview the talk, so it's going to be in three parts. Uh, the first part is on MEV gamma ray astronomy, uh, scientific goals um, in general, and also for COSY, and then the COSY requirements uh, for making the measurements to achieve those goals. Uh, the second part of the talk is um, about general uh, Compton telescope operation, you know, how they work. Uh, and also the COSY balloon instrument. So, um, you know, before we were building a satellite instrument, we flew a similar instrument on um, high altitude balloons several times. Uh, and so we have some data from that that I'll, that I'll tell you about. And then part three is about going from that balloon instrument and, um, you know, dealing with the conditions on a balloon to dealing with the uh, satellite mission um, and the changes that we're making um, there. And I'm happy to take questions anytime. I've got a couple breaks between these parts for people to ask questions. Uh, and then of course, at the end, I'm happy to take questions as well. All right, so part one. Um, all right, so this shows sensitivities um, from previous and current missions um, on this plot here, sensitivity on this axis, energy here. Um, so, uh, you know, in the X-ray band and in the hard X-ray band, uh, you know, we've got very good sensitivities. Um, I actually don't always put Chandra on this plot because it makes uh, everything else look so bad. Uh, but given that I'm given the stock of the CFA, I figured I should put that on. Um, but anyway, we're doing pretty well in the X-ray band. We're also doing pretty well in the GEV band with Fermi Lat. Um, but in between in this MEV region is where the sensitivities have really not been uh, as good. And so the, this is sometimes called the MEV gap, which extends kind of from 100 keV up to 100, 100 MEV. Um, all right, and I'm going to start introducing COSY by talking about missions that are that have some similarities to COSY. Uh, these blue missions here. So um, COMPTEL is a Compton telescope, um, which is like COSY. Uh, the SPI instrument on the integral satellite uh, uses germanium detectors, uh, which is like COSY. Uh, Fermi Lat gets all sky coverage every day, in fact, every three hours. Um, and the all sky coverage every day is like COSY. 
uh, and then New Star uh, uh, studies nuclear lines like like Cozy does. Um, the next slide shows uh, these missions um, along with Cozy. Uh, so Comptel is on the top line here. This is the one mission on this uh, chart that is finished. It flew in the 90s. Um, as I say, it's a Compton telescope, slightly higher energy uh, band than, than Cozy, 0.8 to 30 MeV. Um, you know, as I said, SP instrument on integral uses germanium detectors. It has similar band paths to COSY, um, but what you should see, um, you know, understand with the germanium detectors is that that means that uh, these instruments have very good energy resolution um, because that's what the germanium detectors are good at. Um, Fermi is much higher energy, um, but gets this, you know, has this large field of view and gets this all sky coverage every day. And then New Star operates from 3 to 79 keV. Uh, and does nuclear line spectroscopy. COSY is planned for launch in 2025, um, and uh, it has all these uh, different capabilities. Okay, um, so you know the fact that the sensitivities have not been very good in the MEV previously um, means that there's a lot of discovery space here. Um, but what I like to say is it's discovery space where we know there's a lot of interesting physics. So this includes nucleosynthesis and supernovae stu supernova studies. Um, this, this shows uh, the energies of several nuclear lines in this region. Uh, 511 keV studies of electron-positron annihilation. So you can see the 511 line here. Uh, some sources have, have shown high levels of polarization in this band pass. Uh, even if they don't show high levels in other band passes. So that's another reason for interest in this band pass. And then multi-messenger astrophysics, um, you know, this, this energy range is really critical for that. All right, so I'm gonna talk about those science topics in the next several slides. Um, so starting with nucleosynthesis. So um, aluminum 26 is produced in the, in the galaxy, especially by massive stars. Um, it's, it's released into the ISM both in winds from massive stars and in supernova explosions. Uh, it has a half-life of uh, 0.7 million years. And so what you see when you look at the galaxy in Illumin 26 is, um, you know, all the Illumin 26 has been produced over the last uh, few million years. Uh, when, when Illumin 26 decays, it produces a 1.8 MeV gamma ray. And that, so that's how we're able to study it. And uh, one of the legacies of the CompTEL mission is the mapping of Lumen 26, which is what's shown here. Um, so this is the galaxy in 1.8 MeV light. Um, and so, of course, you see, you know, a lot of emission coming from the galactic plane, which is where the massive stars are. But you also see clumps of emission uh, at specific uh, regions where there are, um, you know, excesses of, uh, of massive stars. So the Cygnus region is, in the, is, is one of the clumps here. Um, Vela is over here, Carina is this one. Um, you know, but the angular resolution is only about 3.8 degrees for CompTEL. Uh, and so you don't get a lot of detail beyond uh, just seeing the different regions. Um, another, you know, besides just understanding the chemical enrichment of the ISM, another important uh, reason for studying Lumen 26 is to um, uh, see what we can learn about the, about the formation of, you know, the next generation of stars and planets. Um, so Lumen 26 is an important heating source, and so there was an interesting study recently um, that this uh, image illustrates of the Ophiuchus region comparing the, um, the, the 1.8 MeV emission, which is shown in red here, uh, with a Planck dust map that maps the, the star forming regions. Um, and so, you know, understanding, you know, where the Lumen 26 is, how it affects uh, star and planet formation um, is a very important topic. Okay, another element that uh, we'll study is titanium 44. Um, and uh, so titanium-44 has a much shorter half-life, only 60 years. Um, it decays in two steps. The first step, it decays to scandium and produces a 68 and a 78 keV emission line. And then the scandium decays to calcium-44 and that produces a 1.157 MeV line. So these lines have been studied by NuSTAR. This will be studied by COSY. Um, this shows two spectra from, from NuSTAR from New Star um, of Cas A on the top here and Supernova 1987A on the bottom. Um, 
An interesting thing that was seen with these is that the titanium lines are redshifted. So in Cas A, it's redshifted by 1,100 to 3,000 kilometers per second. And in Supernova 1987A, it's redshifted by about 700 kilometers per second. Um, and so, you know, this is telling us that the uh, that there's more, more material going away from us than coming toward us. So it's evidence for an asymmetric explosion. Uh, but we only have these two cases. And so COSY will search uh, the galaxy in the 1.157 MeV uh, band pass to look for more young uh, supernova remnants. All right, uh, so next is the electron positron annihilation line. So um, when electrons and positrons annihilate, you produce a 511 keV or actually a pair of 511 keV photons. Um, and so that's the tracer that we see uh, with COSY. Um, aluminum 26 and, and titanium 44, the two elements I just talked about, in addition to producing the gamma ray lines that I mentioned, uh, they also produce po uh, positrons when they decay. And the rates that we expect for the galaxy for, for these uh, from aluminum 26 is about four times 10 to the 42 positrons per second. Titanium 44 is about three times 10 to the 42 positrons per second. Um, this shows the current uh, best image of the galaxy in, in 511 uh, keV emission. Uh, you can see emission from the plane here in the purple and then an excess from the galactic bulge. Uh, these numbers here are uh, you know, roughly right to explain the uh, galactic plane emission, um, but you need many more positrons to produce this excess that is seen in the, in the galactic bulge. Um, and so that's not understood. Um, integral shows some evidence for some, some substructure in there. There might be emission from Sagittarius A star. Sorry about that. Um, and then there are a couple other components, these Gaussians uh, that kind of give a rough idea of what it looks like. Um, but COSY will get a much sharper image of this. And so COSY's objectives uh, are shown here. So one is uh, to get a better image uh, and identify potential positron sources um, or spatial components. Um, second is that the, the integral uh, angular resolution is not nearly as good as COSY, and so this actually um, is consistent with a much thinner disk than it appears, uh, and so COSY will determine the scale height of the disk. Um, also, it will um, uh, provide spectral information that will tell us about both the formation and the annihilation conditions for the positrons. All right. Polarization. So I said that there have been some sources that have shown evidence for high polarization in this band pass. Uh, so one example is the Crab Nebula, uh, where Integral has measured uh, polarization levels between 46 and 98% uh, in the MEV band. Uh, there have been other measurements by Astrosat that have confirmed these high levels. Um, and so that's one example. SIGX1 is another example that shows the SIGX1 spectrum. Uh, so one of the high energy components is a thermal Comptonization component that cuts off here, uh, but then there's extra emission that extends out to higher energies, and it seems like this component is highly polarized. Um, so this is in, in these band passes here at the MEV range, uh, we're seeing levels of about 70% uh, polarization um, from integral. Uh, for gamma ray bursts, it's a little more mixed. So this shows um, a couple dozen uh, gamma ray bursts where there have been polarization constraints. Uh, and you can see some of them show high polarization, some of them show low polarization. Um, it's a little concerning from a systematic standpoint that um, you know, the polar mission uh, seems to show mostly low polarization and other missions. Uh, seem to show high polarization. So getting a, a large number of these with a single instrument like COSY um, could be very useful for uh, kind of, you know, conf confirming, either confirming that there is the scatter that is apparent here or, um, you know, or determining whether there uh, is high polarization levels. So COSY will make polarization measurements for galactic black holes. Um, it'll make the first measurements for AGN, which hasn't, haven't been done before. Uh, and then uh, it will clarify this question of the distribution for the gamma ray bursts. All right, so um, as I said, this range is critical for multi-messenger astrophysics and gamma ray observations have played a crucial role in, uh, in multi-messenger astrophysics observations. So there are three examples shown here on this slide. So one is nearby supernovae. 
uh, where gamma rays and neutrinos have been seen, for example, from supernova 1987A, which is in the large Magellanic Cloud. Um, merging neutron stars are another example that uh, I'm sure people are very aware of that produce gamma rays and gravitational waves. Um, and there's this one you know, really great example. Uh, and then uh, the third example here is um, blazars that uh, convert, produce gamma rays and high energy neutrinos. And I think the jury is still out on whether you know the high energy neutrino population is mostly from blazars or whether some some blazars and that there are other components as well. Um, but Cozy should uh, be able to clarify uh, th that question and answer it. So. Uh, Cozy is going to do rapid reporting for short GRB, um, you know, give localizations quickly for short GRBs, allowing for follow-up observations. Uh, we'll get coverage of all the high-energy neutrino events um, and look for blazar counterparts or other counterparts. Um, and then if there is a nearby supernova, either in the Magellanic Clouds or in the galaxy, um, that would be amazing. Uh, Cozy would see dozens of nuclear lines. We'd learn a whole lot about supernova uh, explosions. Um, uh, but that's not our level one science because it's it's so rare that that, that happens. Uh, but it would be incredible if it did. OK, so this lists the Cozy science goals. So um, they're to uncover the origin of galactic positrons, uh, to reveal ga uh, galactic element formation, to gain insight into extreme environments with polarization and to probe the physics of multi-messenger events. And I guess there are a couple of things I haven't shown yet on, on the slide. So uh, this is what I was saying about the, um, you know, so this distribution here is consistent with the integral distribution, um, but you can see that COSY will constrain the scale height much better for the galactic plane. Um, also, this shows going from uh, you know, a blob of emission that's seen in the Cygnus region with CompTEL to the angular resolution that COSY will provide. Um, this is based on OB associations that are in the Cygnus region. All right, so what are the requirements necessary uh, to do these measurements? Um, so for goal one, uh, this is doing imaging spectroscopy of the entire galaxy at uh, 511 keV. Um, for the second goal, it's imaging spectroscopy of the entire galaxy uh, at these two lines that I mentioned, and also iron 60 is another line that we'll be able to study. Uh, it produces two, actually two emission lines at 1.173 and 1.333 MeV. Um, I guess you won't be surprised to know that we need polarization sensitivity to reach the polarization goal. And then for um, multi-messenger events, uh, we need large fields of view to catch the GRBs and then and, um, you know, reasonably good angular resolution to localize the sources. So collecting all of those things, we need large field of view, high, res high resolution spectroscopy, uh, polarimetry, and moderate angular resolution. All right, so this puts some more specific numbers to that. So um, our sky coverage is more than a quarter of the sky uh, instantaneously. and um, I'll tell you a little bit later how we how we get the whole sky um, every day. Uh, energy resolution numbers are shown here, so we need good energy resolution for two reasons. You know, one is to actually study the shapes of these lines, um, but also, um, you know, simply to be able to have a narrow band where we make our images uh, in order to uh, cut out as much background as possible uh, is the second reason for needing um, high resolution. Uh, our sensitivity requirements, uh, so at 5.11, it's 1 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, and just for reference, the galactic bulge is about 100 times brighter than that. Uh, and then at 1.8 MeV, it's uh, 3 times 10 to the minus 6. So this is about 7 times better than CompTEL uh, in terms of sensitivity. Angular resolution will be about 2 times better than CompTEL. Um, for polarization, which is the third goal, uh, we'll have sensitivity to reach bright AGN in two years. So these are like CEN-A, 3C273, and NGC4151, and also several galactic black holes. So there's you know, SIGX-1, there are a few other persistent uh, galactic black holes that we'll be able to measure polarization for. And then there are always uh, transients. There are you know, a few bright transients a year, and so we expect to be able to measure polarization for those as well. Um, for GRBs, um, to, to reach our goals of uh, constraining the emission mechanisms from GRBs, 
Uh, we need about 30 GRBs with polarization measurements, and we estimate that we'll uh, measure about 40 during the, the two-year mission. Um, then for the short GRBs, um, uh, our goal is to measure at least 10 and provide the rapid localizations to better than one degree uh, in less than an hour, and we expect to get about 20 uh, during the two-year mission. Okay, so that's the end of part one. Um, if people have questions, I can pause here just for a second. Did you quote the angular resolution? Or yeah. does that come later? Or? Uh, yeah, so the angular resolution I had on this slide, which is two, two degrees uh, at 1.8 MeV. Okay, and then it degrades at lower energy. Um, That's right. Can you point at targets? Um, so we, um, I, I'd be interested in hearing uh, why, <laughs> why, um, you know, so we cover- Well, I would part. ask if you could, yeah. if you can uh, look at the sun, for example. Yes, we can look at we can look at the sun. Uh, we will, you know, the sun will be in our field of view. Uh, you know, since we, you know, we do we don't avoid it at all. So we do the all sky survey, uh, and the sun will be going through our uh, field of view. We do have a solar group that we're working with, um, and you know, so one idea that we had is we probably wouldn't point at the sun, but what we would do is um, we could we could. Um, optimize uh, the, the position uh, as we go around the earth um, to maximize the exposure on the sun, like if the sun was active or something like that. Um, I didn't, I haven't, I haven't explained it yet, I have it on a later slide, but the way that we get the all sky coverage is point, pointing to the north for 12 hours, um, you know, but always looking at, at zenith, right? So we're just always uh, going around the earth and the field of view is always changing. So we point to the north for 12 hours and point to the south for 12 hours. Um, and so, you know, we, we constantly go back and forth, but we could stop that, that um, repointing uh, and optimize it for a target or optimize it for the sun. And we call those um, constant zenith angle targets of opportunity. Um, and yeah, that might become clearer when I get to that slide a little bit later. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, um, continue. Okay, so um, this explains why you wanna use a Compton telescope for the MEV band pass. So this shows cross sections for germanium. Um, and so you can see down at lower energies, uh, when a photon uh, hits your detector, it tends to photo absorb. Um, at higher energies, when a photon hits your detector, it tends to, uh, you get paracreation like, like Fermi lat. Um, but in the MEV bandpass, uh, the most likely interaction is a Compton scatter. Um, and so this illustrates um, you know, how that works. Uh, this actually shows our, our balloon instruments. So we had 12 germanium detectors. There are four stacks of three here. Each one is eight by eight centimeters. Um, but the point here is to show gamma ray coming in. Uh, this is a, an example of a three side event where we've got a Compton scatter here. Sorry about that. A Compton scatter here and then a photo absorption here. Um, and so actually, let me go to the next slide. Um, this shows the same kind of event in kind of a more schematic fas fashion. Basically, for every photon that comes in, uh, we can learn two things. We can learn the total energy just by adding up the different interactions. So E1, E2, and E3 here. Uh, and the other thing you can learn is the Compton angle, which is the theta that you see there. So the Compton angle theta defines an event circle on the sky. And, uh, you know, as you know, so for one photon, you don't know exactly where it came from. But as you add up more and more photons, they, you know, for a point source, for example, as shown here, they all cross in the same spot. Uh, and so you start to see sources pop out in your images. And um, I've got one video in this presentation. So it shows this process of the event circles building up uh, and then deconvolving the image. Um, for a, this, is a, this is an example of a point source. 
And so that you asked about the angular resolution, you know, the angular resolution is basically the thickness of these of these circles is what gives you your angular resolution. All right. Okay, so as far as the detector material, so why do we use germanium? I've already mentioned that it gives uh, good energy resolution, and the reason that it does that, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, it you get you get an electron hole pair for every two point nine six eV of of energy that's deposited. So this is a pretty small number, which gives you a large number of electron hole pairs, which gives you the good um, energy resolution. Um, also, germanium has a moderate atom atomic number, so if you had a lower atomic number, uh, you wouldn't have the stopping power for MeV energies, and if you had a much higher one, you wouldn't uh, get the Compton scatters uh, anymore, so um, germanium is good for that. Uh, also, uh, these detectors can be built with a thickness of 1.5 uh, centimeters, and so you can really fill up a lot of your detector volume with active area. Um, which is useful for a Compton telescope. The challenges are that the, the process is pretty complex for making the detectors. Um, also, you need to go to high voltage, so you need about a kilovolt um, or even more uh, to, uh, to get the electron hole collection. And then the detectors need to be cooled uh, to less than 90 Kelvin. All right, this shows uh, kind of in detail one of our detectors and how we get the three dimensional position sensitivity. So these are double sided strip detectors, so they have strips running in orthogonal directions on the two sides. And that's how we measure the X and Y positions. Um, and uh, then the way we get Z is to measure the rise time difference between the two sides, so you can see that illustrated here. Um, you know, so green, for example, uh, you're closer to the negative side, and so you get a rise uh, on the negative side first. All right, uh, I'd like to show the spectra. These are just the spectra that we use for calibration, um, but it actually tells you a lot about what's going on inside the detector. So the main thing we're using here for the calibration is simply you know, the energies of, of the photo peaks, um, but there's also this Compton continuum, and actually uh, the vast majority of the photons that come in uh, are in the Compton continuum. Uh, and so you've got your photo peak over here. Um, you deposit the maximum amount of energy when you have a backscatter. So that's a, a scatter at uh, an angle of, of pi. And the minimum deposit when you have a low angle of, uh, of Compton scattering. Um, and so you end up getting this Compton continuum. So um, let me uh quiz the audience uh and see if anyone can tell me why there are two steps here uh in the cobalt uh spectrum i don't know if anybody's ready for a quiz it's probably a surprise <laughs> um okay i, I don't know if anyone go ahead go ahead I'd say they got two lines, so the two edges that go with them. Yeah, exactly. Right. So there are two lines here, and so you end up getting the getting the two edges. Uh, you know, each you know, the Compton continuum from the one point three three two is here, and the Compton continuum from the one point one seven three is here. Good, good answer. Sorry, it was wasn't a super hard question, but good job. Um, all right. Yeah. Okay. So this shows some of the other hardware from the balloon instrument. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the cryostat shown here, of course, the detectors are inside, uh, the high voltage feed throughs you can see here, uh, and also the, these are the connectors for the preamp boxes, you can see the actual preamp boxes down here. Um, and then this is the cryo cooler uh, attached here to the doghouse, uh, which then there's a cold finger that goes into the detectors there. Um, we use a sun, sun power cryotel uh, cryo cooler. Um, the maximum power is 160 watts. We usually run it around 100 watts uh, for the balloon instrument. And then this is the largest item in the instrument power budget. So that when you're thinking about thermal and um, you know getting rid of the heat from the the, the power that's uh, from the things that are generating power. Uh, this is the first thing that you have to think about, um, you know, how you're going to get rid of the heat that's produced uh, from, from the cryo cooler. 
Um, then the shields are shown here surrounding the cryostat. Uh, so for the balloon instrument, we use cesium iodide. These are four centimeter thick um, uh, cesium iodide shields uh, read out by PMTs. Uh, and then this is the largest item in the instrument mass budget. Um, and so I'll give some more numbers later that, uh, for the satellite mission. And then, oh, these are active shields. So I guess that's clear because they're PMTs reading out the, the, uh, the shields. All right, uh, so we've flown uh, several balloon campaigns, uh, actually flown four times and had four balloon campaigns. Um, so it started in 2005 with a two germanium detector prototype that flew from Fort Sumner. This was actually before I started with the group. Uh, I started the next year in 2006. Uh, and then um, we flew in 2009 with a 10 germanium detector instrument, um, also from Fort Sumner. Uh, before we were called COSY, we were the nu Nuclear Compton Telescope. Um, that's why these NCTs are here. During the 2009 flight, uh, that was the first time we detected the Crab Nebula. So that's what is shown in this image here. Um, the next year, we went to Australia and uh, we had kind of a catastrophic failure of that launch. Um, if people are into ballooning, they may have seen a video of our. A gondola ramming into an SUV and flipping it over and luckily nobody was hurt, but <laughs> it was pretty spectacular. Uh, it took us a little while to rebuild, but we re rebuilt uh, our instrument and actually used a lot of the same hardware, even though if you look at the crash, you'd be amazed that we could recover anything. Uh, but we did and, and rebuilt it and built a 12 germanium detector instrument that we flew in, our, in, in Antarctica in 2014. Uh, and then also in New Zealand in 2016. And I'm gonna talk more about this flight because it was a spectacular flight um, in the next several slides. Uh, we were going to fly again in 2020. And in fact, we, um, we were in New Zealand. We had the instrument all built up in you know, early 2020. And then the uh, campaign was canceled due to COVID, uh, unfortunately. Of course, that was the same time we got selected to start on the satellite version. So the timing worked out from that perspective. All right, this shows the flight path from the 2016 flight. Um, so uh, let's see, so took off from New Zealand, um, actually went back toward Australia, but then flipped around here, went around An Antarctica. Um, and then the second time around the earth, we went to the north a bit and kind of got stuck out in the Pacific Ocean for a while. And then finally came down in Peru um, after a 46 day flight. A um, couple of events I want to point out during the flight. So we saw a very bright gamma ray burst um, about 13 days into the flight. So we were about here. Uh, and then um, during the flight, kind of, you know, as long as we could see the galactic uh, uh, bulge, uh, we were studying the 511 kV emission. And then also the aluminum 26 emission came from the entire flight. And then when we got to the north, at the toward the end of the flight, uh, we were far enough north to see the Crab Nebula. So that was another um, highlight of the data. And then, oh, then this is this is actually a good landing, uh, even though it looks kind of uh, kind of broken. Uh, you know, so this was actually an ideal landing, and nothing got broken at all, which was great. Okay, so this uh, kind of uh, summarizes all the results from uh, the gamma ray burst uh, studies. Um, so one thing we did uh, was we did you know, rapid reporting of the position. So this was the first time this was done for a balloon payload. Um, within you know just a few minutes of the GRB happening, uh, we had an alert system that was set up, and we uh, you know, saw the GRB in the light curve uh, immediately got an image immediately. Um, of course, I was asleep and I didn't write the GC until the next morning. So I don't think we reported this for about six hours until after, you know, after the GRB happened. Uh, but it did tell us that we could go much faster in, uh, in providing that information. Um, and so that was really good. Um, uh, Conus Wind also saw this GRB at the same time and, uh, and they reported it after we did, but uh, uh, they reported spectral information, and so we were able to do a spectral analysis to compare to what they saw. Uh, this just shows the spectrum fit with the band function. 
but our parameters that we got for the spectral were, were um, consistent with theirs, which uh, you know made us feel good that you know our inst our instrument response was well understood and uh, and we also worked out all the machinery for making the response, making the background file. You know we're using XSpec here to to make the spectra. Um, and then also we carry out a polarization analysis. Uh, so we didn't detect polarization, but uh, you know, the signature of polarization is a modulation uh, at uh, uh, you know two cycles uh, uh, going from negative 180 to 180. Um, and uh, you know we didn't detect polarization, but we got a very sensitive upper limit of 46 percent. Uh, the best fit measurement was 16 percent uh, with these error bars. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was very successful. Uh, and then another important demonstration was the 511 keV. So this shows uh, the energy spectrum that we obtained um, during the flight. Um, and so you can see the strong 511 keV uh, mission line uh, detected at 7.2 sigma. Um, we also carried out an imaging analysis. So this shows uh, the image. Um, you know, of course, we're dealing with about a thousand photons or so. So, um, you know, this is actually noise that you see. You shouldn't think of this as being substructure. We did a lot of simulations to convince ourselves that this was noise in the image. Um, but still, we definitely see an extended source. Um, we can do model fitting of this. If we fit it with a two dimensional Gaussian. We can get a line flux. And uh, the value we get is 1.9 times 10 to the minus three, um, which is uh, consistent. At about the two sigma level uh, with what integral is seen. Um, also, we, we can measure the angular size of the emission. Uh, you know, it's 28 degrees and uh, it is extended emission. You can see this does not extend down to zero. So it's extended uh, emission that we're seeing. All right, this summarizes uh, the balloon. So the balloon uh, instrument was an important proof of concept uh, for demonstrating the instrument operation. Um, also, all of our data analysis tools, uh, we use uh, one, one uh, pack, software package called Megalib that Andreas Zoglauer has developed. And then there's a wrapper that we um, developed recently called CozyPy uh, that's going to be the basis for our satellite software. Uh, and Thomas Seeger has done a lot of work on this. Uh, the capabilities that we demonstrated during this flight are the real-time GRB reporting, also the imaging, spectroscopy, polarization um, capabilities, and the main results are, are listed here. So the gamma ray burst results I talked about in the 511, I talked about Illumina 26 was a study we did recently. This was done by my graduate student, uh, Jacqueline uh, Beechert, and uh, detected the, the Illumina 26 line at a significance of about 3.7 sigma. And then uh, we're also working on papers on other point sources. Uh, this shows um, some work that Andreas Zoglauer did, both on the crab spectrum, just from this is less than two days of exposure, just you know during that time when the balloon got far enough north. Um, but then the other kind of nice thing is that this image shows the crab, uh, and all the emission is in one five by five pixel. So you know you can kind of compare this to the extended emission, which is you know spread over. You know many pixels uh you know and for a point source we do see this uh, emission in, in an individual pixel all right um so the next part is going to be on uh going from the balloon to the satellite mission um you know if anybody has any questions before i move on to that yeah i, I don't mean to bring up a side issue but i remember some uh concerns about the uh, positrons annihilating at rest uh, are not in the center of the galaxy. And it looks like you have a perfect spectrum of, of uh, annihilation at rest, whereas it's, you know, it's thought that they uh, should have significant uh, uh, velocities. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what, what, Integral is found, and what we're pretty consistent with is um, that in addition to the 7.2 sigma detection of the narrow line, we also detect, um, you know, this continuum. Uh, and so this is, um, you know, from orthopositronium. So basically, the the um, you know the vast majority of these decays are coming from positronium. Um, which is actually, oh wait, sorry, 
I thought I had a little, oh no, I do have a little, <laughs> I don't mean to, I don't probably don't need to go back to this, but um, yeah, positron, positronium. So just, you know, electron and a positron uh, in orbit around each other. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, more than more than 90% of the, of the emission is coming from that. And that produces a narrow line and this, and this orthopositronium continuum that is below the, below the line. Okay, yeah, sorry, I just didn't notice that in the figure. Oh, no problem. I think that's what you're referring to, yeah. Can I have a question about the uh, five theory? So you said that, you said that, uh, you convince yourself that there is no substructure, so I didn't get that point. So why is there no substructure? Uh, I'm sorry, can, I couldn't didn't quite get the question. Okay. Yeah. So your question, uh, my question is that you showed the 511 kV image on the mm -hmm. previous slide, and you commented that the, the substructure that we appear to see is not there. So can you elaborate on that, maybe? Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, so basically what we did, uh, I should have probably made a slide on this, but what, what we did is we did uh, several simulations at different significance levels. Uh, you know, so, I mean, what, what I said is that this is about a thousand uh, photons, you know, spread over the entire sky. And so there's a lot of noise in the image is what I was saying. And so what we did is we did simulations, um, you know, at seven sigma, at 10 sigma, at 20 sigma, um, you know, all with uh, the true distribution just being a two-dimensional Gaussian, you know, centered at the galactic bulge. Um, and so what we, what we found is that the, at seven sigma detection, um, you know, in our simulation, we see that that two-dimensional Gaussian breaks up into different uh, clumps like this um, just due to, to noise. So, so that's, yeah, that's, that's what I said. But then after you get up to you know, 15 or 20 sigma, then you start to recover the true, um, the true, the true uh, distribution. John, a quick question. Yeah. Uh, Hi, Josh. The, uh, the emission in your very nice image here looks significantly offset from the galactic center. It looks to be at about plus uh, 15 degrees off. Can you comment on that or am I just seeing something? <clears throat> um, I mean, it's true that the largest noise uh, spike is about 15 degrees off, but all of this emission, like in, in the simulations we ran, mm -hmm. all of this emission is actually from the bulge. So you should be okay. looking at all of that when you think about the centroid. But still, I would have thought the brightest would be really at zero, zero. And it's surprising that it's... There's, there's nothing that I know of at 15 degrees or <laughs> that, that, you know, one could imagine is, is contributing here. But anyway, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we have one more question here. Okay. So, so those other two uh, green splotches, are those coincident with the Magellanic clouds? Uh, good question. They're not. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely check that. All right, anything else before I move on? Okay. Um, all right, so this is a list of upgrades that we're making going from the, um, the balloon to the satellite. Um, so, you know, one thing is changing from 12 detectors to 16 detectors. Uh, so this is four stacks of four instead of four stacks of three. Um, changing from 37 strips to 64 strips uh, per side. So this gives us better angular resolution and also better event uh, reconstruction. Uh, changing from cesium iodide for the shields uh, to BGO, which is a denser material. Um, has better stopping power. But the key thing here is I'm gonna actually talk about this in a few slides is making the shield box smaller uh, with the, the denser material. Uh, we'll obviously have a longer exposure because uh, you'll have a two year baseline mission and uh, you know, there are no consumables. So if it you know, goes like most SMEX missions, uh, it'll get extended and, and, and go well beyond its two year baseline mission. 
Um, you know, at MEV, the atmosphere is still a big deal. So for the balloon, the atmosphere is really uh, blocking a lot of the emission, especially at 511 keV. Uh, and so not having that atmosphere is going to be really uh, critical. And then the all sky coverage uh, is, is also something that uh, we don't get with the balloon. And this, I mentioned this slide earlier. Um, and so the, the idea of how we're going to get the all sky coverage is, as I said before, we point 12 hours to the north. Um, you know, then as we go around, we get the entire northern sky, and then we point uh, 12 hours to the south and get the whole southern sky there. And so this repointing, you know, what I was saying before about a target of opportunity for the sun or for the, uh, you know, another interesting source, a black hole transient or something like that, um, you know, would be basically to stop this repointing north and south and just stop at the, at the optimal uh, zenith angle uh, to get the best coverage on, on that source. Uh, and so, you know, direct pointing it does not bias very much uh, in terms of sensitivity, but um, these constant zenith angle TOOs can help a bit, similar to what Fermi does uh, with, with their program. And then, oh, and I guess I didn't say this, but the, you know, we also need a near equatorial orbit to, to minimize the background. Okay, so um, this lists uh, some of the technical uh, changes that we're making um, or technical considerations uh, and going from the balloon to the satellite. Um, so keeping the shield mass low, uh, switching to the ASIC elect electronics. Um, this is to reduce the mass and also uh, to deal with the, the more channels because of the more strips. Uh, to ruggedize the detector support structure for the satellite launch. Uh, so this is to keep the launch lo loads at a acceptable level for the germanium detectors and also to isolate the electronics from the cryocooler vibrations. And I've got a slide with some details on this. And then um, the thermal system uh, is different with the balloon instrument. We actually have uh, uh, a liquid system, uh, you know, where there's a, a radiator on one side and there's heat, there are pipes that run around the cryocooler on the other side to take the heat out. Uh, for the satellite, uh, this is shown here what the thermal system looks like. It's basically still, you know, taking the heat from the uh, cryocooler out to the radiators, um, but using heat pipes. And then, oh, just to give you guys an, a, an idea of the scale, uh, this is one meter from the flat side to the flat side here. Okay, so um, considerations for keeping the shield mass low. So uh, the, the, there's this is the balloon instrument. This is the um, the design for the satellite instrument. Uh, the big change here is going from a cryocooler being on the side of the uh, the cryostat to being underneath the cryostat. Um, and that helps in a couple of re couple ways. You know, one is you can obviously move the, the walls in a little bit, but the critical thing is that you can make the walls much shorter and that saves a lot of mass um, because if you put the cryocooler here, it can be under the electronic electronics boxes, um, but still you need a very tall cryostat for doing that. And then you need very tall shields. So um, we're able to shorten the shields and reduce the mass. Uh, and then also the other way we're making it smaller is by going to the BGO uh, where we can use two centimeters thick BGO instead of four centimeters thick. That can make the housing much smaller uh, than the cesium iodide. Um, but still, this is definitely the largest mass uh, component in, in the satellite. So the shields, uh, you know, even in this design are about 90 kilograms uh, and our limit um, is about 365 kilograms. All right, the ASIC readout um, has been a lot of work that we've done. And this has actually been led by um, the Naval Research Laboratory. Um, so we're uh, making 32 channel ASICs. Um, and so you know, 64 channels on a side, 128 channels per detector. So this is four ASICs uh, to read out the detector. With 16 germanium detectors, we need uh, 20, uh, 2,048 channels. So this shows one detector board with the two uh, NRL ASICs. And this down here shows our detector setup that we have here at Space Sciences Lab um, for we, we hook up the boards with the ASICs to um, the two sides of the detector. Uh, there's a germanium detector in here and then it's cooled with uh, liquid nitrogen. 
Um, the heritage for this ASIC is the NCI ASIC-2, uh, which has been used both for silicon strip detectors and CZT. Um, so in, in both of those cases, they don't need to measure the depth of the uh, interaction, but we do for the germanium. And so uh, that's one of the big changes going from this to, to the NRL ASIC. So the NRL uh, one, we added a timing circuit, uh, which is, gives the depth uh, measurement. Um, we needed better time resolution. And so we separated the energy and timing circuits uh, to allow for different peaking times for the two. Uh, and that's the NRL two. Um, the NRL2 worked quite well, and the next slide shows some results from the NRL2. Um, but there was an instability in the track and hold section of the peak detect circuit, and that was the one reason that the NRL2 is not our flight ASIC. Um, we recently received NRL3, um, and uh, well, it doesn't have this peak detect bug, uh, and, uh, we're, but we're just starting to test it um, right now. So uh, this shows some results from NRL2. <laughs> Um, this is an actual spectrum of barium-133 uh, measured through NRL-2. Um, and then this shows um, the requirements that we have and, and the actual measurements that were made. So um, we, our energy resolution is better than the requirement, 2.4 and 2.9 keV flow with half max. Um, for the dynamic range, this is the, the, the bottom of the, um, the detection uh, range. Uh, we're getting down to 17 keV. And uh, the top, we're getting above eight, uh, 1850 keV. Um, so we need nearest neighbor measurements. So most of the charge it comes down and is deposited on one strip. Um, but to collect all the charge, we also have to read out the neighboring strips. And so there's a threshold for that also. Uh, you can see that this spectrum is actually a single, single strip measurement. So that's why we see some charge loss uh, with these tails here. But when we can add up all the strips, then we'll recover the, the shape of the spectrum. Uh, and then finally, the timing threshold, we met requirements for that. So that's looking good. And the early testing of NRL3 is looking good. Um, the detector support, support structure is uh, another big th uh, thing that we developed uh, during phase A. And in fact, we made an entire uh, support structure shown here. Uh, there's one detector in the support structure, and then there's a bunch of mass dummies. Uh, we did five tests of this. Um, but the design has basically two um, novel elements. Uh, so one is a frangible, um, which is shown here. Uh, so this uh, you know, stiffens the structure and holds it down during launch uh, to protect the detectors. Uh, and then after launch, the frangible, uh, we, re we release uh, the holder structure. Uh, and then there are these springs that are shown here, and the instrument can uh, can bounce on the springs, and this isolates it from the cryocooler vibrations. And we did tests uh, on this vibe table, both uh, you know to make sure that the uh, detector survived, and also uh, we did tests of the frangible release, as well as the spring isolation. So uh, that all worked very well. We did all that during phase A. Okay, um, so this, uh, you know, the main deliverable from phase A is the concept study report. This is the cover of the concept study report. Uh, it was finished in March, 2021. Uh, we had a site visit. It was a virtual visit um, uh, in June, 2021. Uh, and then we started phase B in October, 2021. And then this shows, um, you know, where COSI is in line of the previous missions. You know, I mentioned New Star, which was a previous SMEX. XP was another uh, SMEX that was just launched uh, last year. Uh, and then, you know, Cozy here this year in 2025. All right, uh, so this shows the collaboration. So it's led from UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, so Steve Boggs is also involved. He's from UC San Diego. Uh, Naval Research Lab, uh, as I said, is doing the uh, electronics development, so it's led by Eric Wolf. Uh, Goddard Space Flight Center um, uh, includes these the people you see here. Northrop Grumman is our spacecraft contractor, and then these are the institutions that we're working with. So Clemson, uh, Los Alamos, LSU, and then we've got several international uh, collaborators in France, Italy, Japan, Germany, and Taiwan. 
All right, so this shows uh, cozy uh, you know, requirement level for two years at three sigma compared to previous uh, and current missions. So this is uh, integral SPI, and this is CompTEL. Uh, you can see where the cozy requirement uh, line is. Uh, you know, one reason we're able to do better is because of our large field of view, which gives us a very large uh, grasp, um, which is the product of the effective area and the field of view. Uh, compared to these other instruments. All right, um, so this kind of summarizes the different sources that we expect to see. So, um, you know, we'll be able to do transient science starting from launch, uh, and this will be the GRB alerts and polarization measurements, the correlations with the high energy neutrinos, studying black hole transients, blazars, cla classical novae. We expect to see a couple uh, during the mission. And then type 1a supernovae also we should see um, a couple of those during the mission and be able to detect emission lines. Uh, for the um, emission line science from the galactic center, this shows cozy um, simulations for positrons, lumen 26, iron 60, and titanium 44. Um, and then there are several persistent source types that we expect to see, AGN, X-ray binaries, pulsars, and, and gamma ray binaries. And uh, that brings me to my summary. So um, the MEV sensitivity is lagged behind that of other energy bands, but has a very high science potential. Uh, you know, our balloon instrument has been really important for uh, uh, doing the instrument development and the software development, and it's been a very important proof of concept for us. Um, you know, we have uh, several engineering changes that we've had to make that I told you about. So this is, you know, keeping the shield mass low. Uh, developing the ASIC readout, um, you know, the detective support structure, and also the thermal system is new. Um, and uh, we're just getting started now with, with data challenges. Um, and we're actually, uh, we're doing that internally right now, but in a few months, uh, we'll be uh, inviting the community to join uh, and uh, learn how to analyze COSY data. So um, that's all I have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for that talk. Um, we'll go ahead and see if we have any questions from our live audience first here. Okay, go ahead. I think you should just speak into that. Well, as I recall, um, Comtel was about 1% efficient in detecting gamma rays in the MEV range. And I wondered how much more efficient you are. I can't hear you. Yeah, uh, that's right. So. Um, we are a lot more efficient. So CompTEL is about 1% uh, and COSY is about 10%. Um, and, you know, so one reason to kind of understand that is that, you know, CompTEL had these two planes that were separated. And so there was a very good chance that you would get a scatter in, in one plane and it would scatter out of the instrument. And the advantage with COSY is you've got this, you know, three-dimensional um, active region uh, which greatly uh, increases our efficiency. All right, other questions from our audience here? All right, uh, we can go over to our Zoom question. I see Dan has a question. Yeah, I was uh, interested in, in what you expect for the dead time from your anti-coincidence shield based on what you expect its rates to be. I, I really should be asking how fast uh, all the electronics are. Yeah, yeah. That you're right. That the shields do um, do that. They're they're the the main source of dead time, uh, and uh, it will produce a dead time of about about ten percent. Yeah, I mean we're we're background dominated, so the rate doesn't change that much. So the background is pretty, or the dead time is pretty constant at at ten percent. So do you never go in the South Atlantic anomaly or just minimize it? I'm, I'm worried yeah, about going, it. Yeah, going equatorial minimize. Yeah, sorry. Going equatorial minimizes it, but it doesn't, uh, we don't miss it entirely. Uh, so we, we will still have SAA passages. Uh, and so um, we'll actually have a particle detector on board that I didn't talk about at all, but we'll have a particle detector that will um, well, that will kind of tell, tell us when we're coming out of the SAA. When we're going in, we'll see that with the shields, no problem. OK, 
Okay, I think I saw uh, Jack's hand up next. Great talk, John. Um, I, one, one thing I was curious about is, uh, I, I believe there's sort of a catalog of um, unusual, unexplained um, transients that have been detected by BAT and by GBM. And so you're sort of in a sweet spot, I think, to detect um, you know, the, the sort of hard x-ray end of those unusual events. And I wonder if you guys have given thought to sort of how, it, do you have any ideas for what rate of sort of potentially new sources you might be picking up based on what those other uh, other missions have seen? Yeah, so, um, and we thought about that some with individual populations like blazars and, and things like that. And so we have some estimates for, um, you know, seeing uh, 60 or 70 uh, blazar flares and things like that. Um, you know, we also are planning to have a, like an input catalog. So I'd be interested in seeing, in, in, you know, knowing specifically the sources you're talking about because, uh, you know, we'll want to have a, you know, an input catalog, but then we'll also detect sources uh, blindly. Um, and so uh, I don't have numbers for, for that um, just because it's hard to predict <laughs> what you don't know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll have a capability of finding new sources, uh, you know, but I think it'll be really key to have an input catalog so that, you know, we can look to match up sources with known sources uh, at the beginning. So that's great. I, um, I'm sure there's more recent work, but there's a paper by Gerls and Canizzo on some of these unusual systems. It's probably a good 10 years old now. Okay. All right, uh, we also have a question from um, Harvey. Hey, John. Uh, it's about 50 years ago, a little more, that we launched Uhuru into an equatorial orbit. I was wondering what the launch site was and what the launch vehicle is going to be to put you in your orbit. That's a great question. I wish we knew. <laughs> <laughs> so we are actually uh, in a position where um, we have to design to a Pegasus launch, which would be from Kwajalein Island. Um, but we may very well, I, I'd say there's probably a 90% you know, chance that we'll end up with a Falcon launch. And if it's a Falcon launch, then that has enough power that it can launch from Kennedy, just like XP did. And XP got into a zero degree inclination orbit launching from Kennedy. So um, those, are the, those are the two possibilities. Um, and I wish we could design to the Falcon, um, but we're designing to the Pegasus and we'll find out after PDR um, which, which launcher we're going to get. Yeah. Okay, it sounds good. Yeah, I remember the XP launch was a lot less, more recent than 50 years ago, and they did get a great launch, and Martin told me a little bit about it. And yeah. I guess that'd be great if you could get that. Yeah. All right, any other questions from our audience here or online? All right, with that, we'll thank our speaker again. Thanks for the great talk, Doc. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see you.